Hi, welcome back to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and this is part four in our ongoing series to learn the two-player game, Guild Ball, using the kickoff starter set, which was designed and published by Steamforged Games. In the description of this video, you'll find links to the other ones in this series, including the last one, where we talked about the rules for attacking. But it's not just about bashing your foes, sometimes you need to maneuver around them. So in this video, we're going to learn about the rules to movement. But let's begin by learning some general rules related to this action. When moving, models always go in straight lines, but can change direction at any point. So Friday moving a total of six inches could go two inches to here, then change directions, go another three inches here, and then a final inch to this position. Distances are always measured from the nearest point on the edge of a model or marker's base towards the direction that it's moving. And although models are fixed in a single pose, you should imagine that they're always in motion, looking around and turning as necessary, so that the direction the model appears to be facing has no actual effect on the direction that they can go. However, a model may never move over another model's base. So if Friday was moving in this direction, she could not pass over this figure. She'd have to stop here. Or instead, choose a path that travels around the other models. Players also have excellent ball handling skills, so their movement is not affected in any way when they have possession of the ball. It will simply travel with them wherever they go. Also keep in mind that a model may never voluntarily leave the pitch. That said, if they're forced off the pitch by an effect, perhaps from an attack of an opponent, they are removed from play and given the taken out condition, as we learned about in the second video of this series. Finally, there are four general terms that we should be familiar with that might come up when fulfilling the instructions provided by movement effects. And those are towards, directly towards, away, and directly away. So let's take a look at what those mean right now. When instructed to move towards something, a model or marker can only move in such a way that the distance between it and the target is always decreasing. Likewise, when instructed to move away from something, the distance between it and the model or marker must always be increasing. In both of these cases, you have some options. For example, whether I move like this or like this, I would be satisfying the conditions of moving towards this ball. Likewise, to move away from it, I can go in any direction that takes me farther and farther away from the ball. Now, if told to move directly towards a target, the model or marker that I am moving must follow an exact path that travels from its center point towards the target's center. So to move directly towards the ball, in this case, I must draw an imaginary line from here to here and then follow it precisely as I move. Moving directly away from something follows the same principle, except that as you move along that precise line, you must always be increasing the distance from the target. With those general rules for movement in mind, now let's get into the specifics. At any point during a model's activation, it can perform what is known as a standard advance. And you can choose to resolve this in one of three different ways. It can jog, which costs no influence and allows the model to move up to its base move amount, which we saw in a previous video was the value on the left, shown under their movement stat. Distances in this game are always measured in inches, so Flint could jog five inches. If the model spends one influence, it may instead advance with a sprint, allowing it to move up to its max move value, which is the number shown here on the right. So Flint, could sprint up to eight inches. And finally, for its standard advance, a model may instead charge, which requires it to target an enemy model within its line of sight that it is not currently engaging. In other words, Flint here could not charge at Spigot if Spigot was within his melee zone of one inch. Also, you cannot charge with your model if you're being engaged by an enemy model. So again, here, Flint cannot charge at Spigot because Friday is currently engaged with him. However, as long as you have a legal target, to initiate the charge, you then pay two influence. You now move towards the target, in a straight line only, up to your figure's max move distance. And if able, end this advance engaged with your target. So because you have to move in a straight line, that means Flint could not charge directly towards Spigot 
if Honor was positioned here, because in that case his base would cross over her base. But remember to charge, you just have to move towards your target, not directly towards. So if he followed a path like this, he could stop here, which would leave him engaged with Spigot. After this movement, the active model then performs an attack against the target model and gains plus four to its dice pool. This attack also doesn't cost any more influence. So while Flint would normally have a dice pool of four when attacking due to his tack value, because of the charge, he'd then gain four more. That said, if after a charge, the active model fails to end its advance engaged with its target, the charge is unsuccessful and the charging model's activation immediately ends. So now we know that at any point during a model's activation, it can perform a standard advance, and that is either a jog, a sprint, or a charge. And during that movement, it might actually gain a modifier to its movement ability. It might pass through an area that would gain it a benefit, or perhaps even cause it to lose some of its movement, and those effects should be applied immediately. I also want to point out that once during a model's activation, it can choose to forfeit its standard advance. For example, to recover from the knockdown condition, a model may forfeit its standard advance and will not count as having moved that turn. Sometimes a model may be affected by a play or a character trait, like the one we see here called Second Wind, which is found on a model not included in this kickoff set, but which provides an additional advance to a model. These effects will always indicate whether that additional advance will be a jog, sprint, or charge, and none of these will ever cost additional influence. But these are not considered standard advances, so unlike a standard advance, you can't forfeit them. Now let's talk about something known as a parting blow. If during an advance, the active model leaves the melee zone or the line of sight of an enemy model that it is engaged by, that enemy model may immediately perform a parting blow against it. So for example, if Flint was leaving the two inch melee zone of Tapper here, then Tapper could choose to perform a parting blow at this point. This is an attack that doesn't cost any influence and the attacking model then gains plus two to its tack value, meaning it would roll an additional two dice in its dice pool. Also while making a parting blow attack, you ignore any ganging up or crowding out modifiers. You also can't generate momentum points from playbook results during a parting blow attack. So while Tapper could choose this knockdown momentous result, he would not gain the momentum point that would normally go along with it. Parting blows also can't cause character plays or pushes or dodge results. Only damage, knockdowns, or tackle results can be chosen. During a single activation, a model may suffer several parting blows if it leaves the melee zones or lines of sight of multiple figures. But as each parting blow is resolved, the active model may continue its advance if it's still able to. For example, if it's knocked down during a parting blow, it won't be able to continue its movement. The movement we've been learning about so far, jogs, sprints, charges, these are known as advances, but there's another type of movement as well known as repositioning. This is any type of movement not classified as an advance. So repositioning would include dodges and pushes. We saw that these can be performed as part of playbook results, but other effects can cause them too, like Honor's character play here called Quick Time. When used, this allows a target-friendly model to make a two-inch dodge. When dodging, you can change direction, whereas in a push, you can't. So in a push, if you would run into an obstruction, barrier, or another model's base, then you have to stop. Remember earlier, we said you cannot voluntarily leave the pitch. A push, however, is not a voluntary movement. So if Mallet here was to push Tapper, he could choose to push him in this direction, which would force him to leave the pitch and suffer the taken out condition. Because dodges and pushes are reposition movements and not advances, they can't trigger parting blows. So for example, if Mallet here dodged in this direction, leaving Friday's melee zone, she could not perform a parting blow against him. Also, repositions receive no penalties or bonuses from terrain or ground unless otherwise noted. Before wrapping up, let's talk about the ball. 
When a model is in possession of the ball, you show this by placing it against that figure's base. However, the ball has no real physical position on the pitch while a player has possession of it. You just place it against the base so you can clearly see who has the ball. But you can freely move it around the figure as you like. For example, if Flint wanted to move into this position, we would just move the ball like this so there's room for him. If there were so many figures surrounding Spigot that the ball couldn't even be placed next to him, then you would just place it nearby and make a mental note that Spigot has the ball, placing it back against his base as soon as you had an opportunity. While a player has possession of the ball, you should consider that the model itself is the current location of the ball marker, even though the plastic piece for it is sitting out here on the field. When a model in possession of the ball moves, the ball marker remains in that model's possession throughout the movement. So after moving Spigot, I would just put the ball back in base contact, like this. During its activation, as long as a model is not engaged by enemy models, it may give up possession of the ball at any point, which is not an action. You simply place the ball marker within one inch of the figure that's giving up possession. When the ball is not in a model's possession, it is considered a free ball. When a model gives up possession of a ball in this way, like Spigot just did, it cannot regain possession of it within the same activation. If a model in possession of the ball marker suffers the knockdown condition, for example, if Brick here knocked down Spigot, then you scatter the ball marker by placing this standard scatter template centered on the knockdown model, with the number one pointing in the direction of the active model's goalpost. And then you roll a die. From this die value, you then find that arrow. This is the direction that the ball is going to scatter in. Then you roll a second die to give you the distance in inches that the ball scatters, measuring from the base of the knockdown figure and centering the ball marker on the target distance, which was three inches in this case. Finally, we have the snap to rules. A model that starts its activation or moves within one inch of a free ball may choose to take possession of the ball marker, snapping it to its base. For example, if Flint here was moving to this position, he could choose a path that would bring him to within one inch of the ball, it would then snap to his base, and then he could continue traveling with it in his possession. If the ball is ever placed within an inch of a model, perhaps because it was scattered, even if that model is not currently active, that model may choose to take possession of it, snapping it to its base. Keep in mind, a knocked down model can never have possession of the ball, so the ball marker would never snap to it in that case. If each team has one or more models within one inch of the ball marker when it's placed, then each of them may roll a six-sided die and add their base kick value to the result. Flint has a base kick of four for a total of nine here, and Spigot's base kick is three for a total of six. The model with the highest value would then gain possession. However, if more than one model has the highest values, only those models would re-roll until the tie was broken and possession was finally assigned. And with that, you now have the rules for movement as well as possession of the ball. In the next video, we're going to go over the actions related to kicking, like passing the ball or trying to score a goal. But if you have any questions about anything that you saw here, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.